And Sasa Men, Tata Ha. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. You've been sitting for a long time. I want everyone to stand up. That's right, you made it. You're here. This is the last speech. Almost the last speech. Give a little bit of stretch. Here we go. Stretch. Back. Four. Oh, that's right. I see you getting into it right there. Getting those arms. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I want to, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about my projects. I want to speak to you all, not necessarily about design itself, but how we become designers. So I'm going to share with you some very personal things. Uh, today is the first time I've ever given this presentation. So first time. No one has ever seen this presentation before. I'm going to play some music. I'm a pianist. So the music that you hear, most of it will have been from me. And I want to combine that with the design and tell a story. So thank you for letting me be here. I'm super honored. Let's get started. So my name is Kyle Mertensmeyer. You may know me as Yin Ming Kai or Ming Kai. I'm, uh, I'm from Shanghai, I've been in Shanghai for six years. So sometimes I say, Wosu Shanghai Ni. Shanghai all. I know there's a lot of people from Shanghai in the audience today. We have Jiangsu province here. I have two design companies. The first one is Shanghai Godolphin, or Godolphin. And we are mostly, we, all we do is wine. We love wine, we love the design of wine, and I call it the, the world of wine. If there's a bottle of wine involved, or a glass of wine involved, or education, we're doing it. And we like to call it wow, wow, because when people come into our projects, that's what we want them to feel. We want them to walk into our spaces and go, wow, world of wine. The second company that I have is a, it's a consulate, or Ming Khan Shu. We have, uh, we do uh, basically design and strategy for small developers. The reason we called it consulate is because I feel like I've, I've lived my life on the border. This border between east and west. I'm always explaining to people at home in the west what it's like to live in the east, and I'm always talking to people in the east what it's like in the west. So I feel a little bit like a, a consul. We also have another border, a border that is uh, of the design world between the normal world and the design world. Sometimes you could say the people in the normal world, they're maybe muggles, if you like Harry Potter. I'm not trying to be arrogant, just being funny. But one of the things that, that I find is that when I work on a project with people, we're always trying to take them into this other place across that border. I like to think that consulate is that place they can come to do that. So my personal point of view, as I explained a little bit earlier today, is that this is not about design itself. What I'd like to talk about is really how we become designers. Um, Wesley talked a little bit about this and so forth, and I appreciate that very much. Um, this is really about a journey. So, you know, I didn't go to a fancy school. I went to a school called Judson University in Chicago. I don't, what you don't need is a space like this. You don't need a fancy school to be a great designer. You don't need a studio to be a great designer. You don't need a fancy office or a fancy computer to be a great designer. What you need is experience. You need life experience. Experience surrounded by the senses, your five senses. When I walk into a space, I'm often thinking about what am I hearing? What am I tasting? What am I smelling? What am I touching? I, I love it when I walk into a space, you can actually taste the space. Sometimes that happens in a restaurant, sometimes you smell perfume, you can almost taste perfume. I love it, I love walking in a space and, and touching the fabrics, or feeling when there's been an imprint on a wall with wood. So this is, your five senses are really actually important when you design. If you're not using them, you're missing out. Frank Lloyd Wright knew this, and all of his apprentices had to learn to cook. All of his apprentices had to learn to sculpt with their hands, making with their hands. All of his apprentices had to learn to clean, and they even had to put on shows and act and, and, and learn to play music. 
And they didn't just construct their buildings and didn't just design them, but they built them with their own hands. Their first project was to build their own. So I would like to take a stance and say that life experience is the intervention itself. Because as designers, we do a lot of design. We're always designing. But we need to take the time to learn to cook, to learn to drink with each other, to learn to talk across the table with our clients, to express ourselves and to express our love and our emotion and our art, and to not just make things by clicking on a mouse. All of us know how to use a mouse, but how many of us know how to craft? We can all place a camera in the computer and make a 3D rendering, but how, how many of us really know how to go out and sideline the photography of your project? I'm going to pause on this right now. That's, that's me, Chihuahua. Um, I love to play piano. This is my personal door through the border. Music, piano, um, com composition. Often after a really hard, long day in the office, I will go and I will sit and I will play for 30 minutes to an hour, just whatever comes in my head. Some of you may paint, some of you may dance, some of you may sketch, but this is what I do. Um, it's proven to be more important than design in my life. There have been many times when people would say, yeah, you're a great designer, but there's lots of designers, and they'd hear me play, and then be standing at the door waiting for me with a name card saying, you're a great pianist, let's have lunch someday. So it wasn't so much that I was a great designer, it was that I was a great pianist. And that was really strange to me. But what I've learned more and more is that music and design, at least for me, they come hand in hand. I handed some of my music to a professor once, and he said, I never understood you until I heard your music. I never understood why you were doing what you were doing until I listened. So today I'd like to have the chance for the first time to actually play some music that I composed when I was in high school, actually. And I will, it will kind of come in and out of the presentation. A bit a little bit low. So I'm originally born in Chicago. Chicago is the city of Frank Lloyd Wright, Louis Sullivan, the first skyscraper. And this is the view from the top of the Jan John Hancock Tower. When I was a little boy, between the ages of one and five and so forth, we would go up here and I'd sit and I'd look outside the city. And, and I just don't know how you couldn't stand at this view and be mesmerized and not want to create something so beautiful. Then my family moved to Arizona. And Arizona was a dry, flat desert. And suddenly I began to see all of these roads being built out of nowhere, much like I see in China now. This is a snapshot from 1985 when I was born all the way up to 2016. You can see the city changing constantly. City Phoenix became the fifth largest city in less than five years. This is my dad's farm. My dad grew up on a farm. We had the farm until just recently. So this has a major impact in my life, where as if you're in the city all day long, every day, and you're suddenly able to go into nature and understand nature, go pick an ear of corn from the field and actually eat it right there, it has an incredibly profound impact on you. This is uh, my last project with Gensler in Shanghai. And the reason I left Gensler was mostly because I wanted to begin to do smaller, more tactile things things that I could control with my own hands and with a smaller team. I loved my time there. So let's, how did it all begin, right? This is how I began. It's a little bit crude, but I actually own these things. That's my favorite Lego set when I was like two years old to five years old. That's the book that I had. This book was amazing. I was supposed to be taking a nap, supposed to be sleeping, and I'd grab this book and I'd read through it. And uh, I was always the kid that wanted to build the blocks like the tallest they could in kindergarten. How many of you had blocks and Legos? I think every designer at some point has had some kind of blocks, Legos, or Lincoln Logs. So then I tried to sketch some of my own. These are, these, are, these are like literally sketches I did when I was like nine years old. I haven't showed them to anyone before, so you guys are very, very lucky. Uh, don't look anymore. And then I had all these favorite masters that I would would, would read books on constantly. Frank Lloyd Wright, Louis Sullivan, Buckminster Fuller, Carlos Scarpa, 
If you don't know Carlos Scopper, you gotta go find out about uh, Carlos Scopper. And of course, Louis Kahn. Louis Kahn may, when I was a kid, may have been the most influential architect of my life. So I'd like to share a little video clip with, with for you. This is the Salt Institute in California. It is the project that Louis Kahn said he loved the most. It was the one that he felt he had done right. The reason I also want to show you film is because somehow I've begun to learn that photos and photography are beautiful, but they don't capture the motion, the movement, the sunlight, all of the things that are really important when we design. Being able to see a sunrise or a sunset and the scale of a person moving through a space, is, these are all of the things that as designers we should be thinking about. And I'm going to play this clip, if you can hear it. He's talking about brick. Brick, for instance, you say to brick, what do you want, brick? And brick says to you, I like an arch. And if you say to brick, look, marshes are expensive, and I can use a, a concrete lintel over you, what do you think of that, brick? Brick says, I like an arch. <clears throat> I like the film, My Architect. Uh, it, it, the quotes and the images always stood with me. This is another movie that has never left my memory. How many of you know what this is? Does anybody, anybody know? Hands up. This is Star Wars. Episode 4. We got people to know what this is. I don't know why, but from the first time I saw that, I could not get it out of my head. The shape and the des whoever designed the sh underbelly of that ship, it has stayed with me. Another film that has stayed with me is 2001 Space Odyssey. You should be sensing a theme here, space. I love space. I'll never forget this shot, going through the portal, the lights, the lost sight lines, the geometry, and the color, the yellow spacesuit, the red spacesuit, the blue spacesuit, it's the orange packs against the white. It's exquisite. Good luck, Mr. Bond. James Bond. So James Bond films are another really huge impact in my life. Not that I watch them all the time, but that somehow they seem to capture the most beautiful spaces. These are houses by John Laudner, who is an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright. And this is not just a movie set. This is from You Only Live Twice. This is an actual piece of architecture that they built, not just a set. Someone had to go out and do this beautiful sketch and do the drawings to build this place. And what I found through my discovery of film was that all of the things you see in film at one point had to be a sketch, they had to be drawn. So you see sketches by Sid Mead for Blade Runner and John Berkeley for Star Wars. And even Livius Woods did some, some work for the new films. And then this is my own work from freshman year to graduate year. You can kind of sense a theme. But in my graduate year, I really wanted to explore and figure out if I could do the same thing that these other designers were doing. Even though their worlds weren't becoming reality, they were somehow taking themselves out of reality and creating worlds that you could imagine and explore and see in film. This was our first project that we did out of, uh, I did out of college. You can see this concept in con continuity between the underbelly of the ship and the most recent project. And that portal again in one of our, so I didn't even know this connection. I'm not even, it wasn't, it wasn't intentional. And this is our lung. We created this lung as a, as a way to study how air could move through an element and potentially be filtered using a green wall system. So none of these connections were intentional. There are things I just happened to find over time, and I wanted to share how things from the past 
suddenly come back and start to influence things in the future. So the next thing that I really enjoy so much is teaching at Tongji University in Shanghai. We have a really cool project in our environmental design studio, and that is working with the students to create their first 3D form. So the students are going from 2D into 3D. So I want them to start thinking about the environment and all of the sort of movements and shifts that happen in the environment. We have earthquakes, we have glaciers that are melting, we have shape in positive and negative space above and below. And when a glacier breaks, it's not just a single graphic, but it's a constant, constant movement that can be displayed in graphic form and then emulated into 3D model, but using your hands. So clouds as well. Clouds are always changing, shifting, moving, solid, void space. And they provide us with these beautiful scapes. So we asked our students to present on mirrors to think about what that depth could become. I also like the salt rock. The salt rock looks like nothing natural. It has such beautiful geometry. So I wanted the students to be inspired about the concept of things within nature shifting and moving. So we gave them these sticks and we set them to work. Pick out your movement within nature, find your inspiration, put them together. And they created some beautiful works. Positive, negative, looking at how that moves and translates. This student picked a wave and then emulated that wave through graphic into the 3D model. You can see the wave going up. This student actually picked out volcanic eruption, volcanic movement, and then diagrammed it as it would move, and then took that movement and put it into the model, and even had pieces of the model tracking off of the site. So then, our last year's class was able to actually complete that process and go out to Suzhou, out here in Suzhou on the Yancheng Lake, and uh, we were able to take it and scale it up to full size. So those little, little blonde sticks suddenly became bamboo. So the students had to work together to think about how does something that was once able to be picked up with two hands become something that you could actually walk into and explore. So you get these spaces internally like this where you're no longer just putting a cell phone into a model. How many of you take your cell phone and put it in your model and try and get a good shot, right? Well, now you're walking into the it yourself and you're exploring that space. So scaling up is probably one of the most important things. And you can see the, the numbers on the bamboo are where this, we use the grasshopper model and to come up with a form of production so that on the site we could actually manually track each piece of bamboo and the length and assemble them by hand. And this was a shot actually used for Domus. We called it the, the cloud forest. I didn't pick the name. And it's beautiful. Um, thank you. Our final, uh, not almost final, I'm glad you guys like it, that makes me happy. Um, I want to move into some professional work. Um, this is some what we do at Shanghai Go Dolphin. Uh, this is one of our first big projects I'd like to share. This was a, uh, this is me playing again by the way, just you know, put that music together with it. But this was when we first came to the site. It's a, it's a, it's a bunker built in 1969 in Wuhu in Anhui, Anhui province. It's about six hours due west of Shanghai. My, one of my best friends, Matt, came out to work with me on it from the States. We spent about eight months from the beginning of design to the end of construction. And what you'll find is all of this rock that was being dug out as they would expand the tunnels, because the old tunnels needed to be made larger, needed to be expanded. So you get these beautiful caves. But we weren't allowed to keep those beautiful caves. The government said we have to put the concrete back in for safety regulation. 
So I said, okay, no problem. We're going to take all the rock that you quarried out, and we're going to take it and we're going to put it back in. And we're going to use the Gabion vault to create the rock arches and rock walls. And then we actually got approval after lots of fights to open up the wall to a few spaces so that the people would come and visit can actually see the original rock that was there. The, the spaces, the programmatically a museum, uh, a wine restaurant, lounge, uh, wine retail, uh, private wine tasting rooms, materials with some Chinese form and our contractor told us that he never goes to projects but every three months the owner but that for this project he showed up every single day and in the beginning it was really hard working with him and in the end he became our best friend and he told us that he suddenly realized he wasn't building a piece of construction but he was building a piece of art These are the wine lockers. So members to the club will be able to buy a wine locker and then store about 200 bottles for their personal collection. And we design the wine lockers, we design the furniture, we design the tables and the doors. This is the private cellar for the owner. It's kind of what they would call the showcase cellar. This is where the chairman will come, where the government will come where all the visitors would come. We have the space, you come in and it's centered around this wine vase. And you go up into the wine vase and then you turn around into the space. And when you turn around, you're approached with this mirror. So suddenly, you're, you didn't know the mirror was there because when you walked in, it's behind you. And you turn around and everything you saw is reflected back at you with you in the middle. We floated the bottles so that the light could cast across the shelf underneath them. So there's no sort of shadow being cast by the bottle. My photographer, Rob, if you're really getting into design, I suggest you find your photographer to work with you regularly. My partner, Yin. Thank you. I have two more projects. So this is, this is actually for a school. This project is an education project. We only need a little wine education. So we have a gymnasium, and they're going to build a new department in this gymnasium. And it's this double height space. And we're thinking to ourselves, what do we do with this really small floor plate, like here, like double height? And I thought, you know what? In our last project, we designed a piece of art. This time, let's design a machine. If Leonardo da Vinci can design a machine, we can design a machine. So, we started to think about this concept of the wine Ferris wheel going up and around and creating these stacks. Each stack would hold about 800 bottles. And then, how do you get your bottle? Well, what we wanted to do was think about how you create an app. You use the app to find the stack, find the bottle, and create the internet of things. So you're not just interacting with the design, but you're actually a part of the process. We have a studio or a workshop where we make test models and mock up things. 
And this is the final, this is just on my iPhone, as we were doing the final installation and the final check, you can see it's actually a, a machine going around. I originally wanted to use a really, really big steel wheel, but it turns out that those are like Lian Wan, like crazy expensive per wheel. The drill trick was to get the boxes as it's moving, not to shake. Because you have the wine in the box, and as the box is moving, you don't want to shake the wine. So that became very important. So we had to test multiple different ways to get the boxes to go, go up and over without shaking and moving. You also see the V in the box. You see the V in the base of the structure, and the V, the upside down V, it's more like an A. It's an A. Um, for the overall structure. And the reason for that is that everything has to be supported at one point at the top. So throughout the design, we were very, very consistent by keeping this A, or upside down V, throughout the project. And then the sound is really cool. sound. Those beats were my beats. I made that just for that thing on the iPad. So this is the International Wine and Spirits Museum. This is, we just won an award that I will go accept in June. Sharon Shelters from IIDA headquarters. And IIDA would like to extend a sincere thank you to all who entered the 2017 Interior Design Competition and World Chain Design Competition. Congratulations to the World Chain the International Wine and Spirits Museum by Shanghai Hidalgo. This space is basically what it looked like, minus the candles when I first arrived. It's the ultimate example of the five senses. Because there was no light, all we could smell was mold and must. We could taste the chalkiness of the dust as we'd walk in there because it had been abandoned for so long and we could feel the texture on the walls. You can see the wood walls. My friend asked me five years ago, he said, Kyle, I have this project. I'd like it if you could come and take a look at this bunker. I have a dream. And I said, I like dreams. I like dreaming. Let's go look at it, dream together. So everything in here we did as, as installation. We didn't want to change the bunker. We didn't want to touch the bunker. It's this beautiful, original white paint. And you can even see on the wall little bits of the red where it had been cataloged back in the day. This, is, this bunker was built pre-World War II, so we're talking like 19, late 1930s. All of everything in here, the, the wine crates are the original wine crates from the client. They're actually wine crates of bottles he was selling and then kept the wood. So the wood had been reused from the project. Several of the bottles used in the project we had, had kept from when they had had events and we kept the bottles. And here's that ship. I didn't know it until recently and I looked back at that and I thought that looks like a spaceship sitting there in my door. This is actually a door inspired later I realized from Star Trek. You're actually allowed to have two options when you come in. You can come in around the outside, or you can make the decision to go into the, the round, what I call the barrel room. So I like giving you choice in design. You, you have the choice to go left or to go right, and each experience will be different. The chairs are an homage to Frank Lloyd Wright, the high back chair, creating the outside space as move, moving space, the talking space and drinking space and our sort of round bell room again. Kind of links back to 2001 Space Odyssey. So I'll leave you with this. 
Frequent writes that a great architect is not made by way of brain, nearly so much as by way of a cultivated, enriched heart. So if I was to translate this, it would say, Bu Wang needed Chu Xing, right? Don't forget your original heart. Design is not in your brain. It is not necessarily in the school. It's not in the office. It's in your life experiences, and it's in your heart. Thank you.